Hey everybody and welcome back to See Elise. Today you're gonna see Elise clean and crime. Welcome back to another episode of Cleaning and Crime. Look, I love to listen to true crime while I clean my house and do my chores, so I've merged the two and every week I post a new motivating cleaning video while at the same time, I sit in a little bubble and I tell you a true crime story that's interesting to me. And today's story, oh, it's interesting. <laughs> I cannot believe I have never heard this case. Today's story is going back in time and we're gonna talk about Dolly O'Strike. Dolly was born Walburga Korschel in 1880. And luckily for us, she went by Dolly. So that's much easier for me to say. Dolly's parents were German immigrants who settled with Dolly in Milwaukee, Wisconsin. A lot of Germans, including my ancestors, came over from Germany and settled in Wisconsin, which is probably why we have such good sausage and cheese and beer. Mm. You're welcome. When Dolly was 12, she started working at a textile mill where the women would typically make aprons. Now the owner of the mill was Fred William Osterreich. Fred was also a German immigrant and he frequently hired immigrants to work in the factory with him. Fred was hella successful. He worked all the damn time, business was excellent, and he was getting rich. Dolly was a super personable girl, very cute, very friendly, outgoing, and it didn't take long before Fred noticed Dolly. That might sound creepy AF, but Fred wasn't like some old creepy man. He was actually only a few years older than Dolly, which is hilarious to me. Like He was like 15 or 16 and he's totally running this entire factory. Where are your parents? It was different times. So anyway, it wasn't long before Fred and Dolly started a romantic relationship and they ended up getting married when Dolly was 17, which would put Fred right around like 20, 21. Now apparently Fred was a bit of a dick and no one liked him. So Fred and Dolly were quite the unlikely pair. Like Fred's a total dick and Dolly was a delight. Everyone liked her and she was known to be the one to put out Fred's fires. And she actually started taking on more of a cover my husband's ass employee relations type role in the factory rather than making aprons. What do they say? Behind every successful man is a woman rolling her eyes. <laughs> Things were going pretty well for years until Fred and Dolly actually lost their only son. There isn't that much information on the subject, which is often the case for some of these older cases. We do know that the son died very unexpectedly. We think he was like adolescent age, maybe even early teens, but it doesn't really matter how the kid died or how old he was. It's a tragic loss, no matter the circumstances. And naturally, there was a strain on Fred and Dolly's marriage after the loss. Dolly wanted to lean on her husband for support, but Fred could not, he couldn't deal. So he threw himself into work. And he also threw himself into the bottom of a whiskey bottle. And that left little time for Dolly. And Dolly was not getting what she needed from Fred. You know what I'm saying? So it was rumored that while Fred was away, Dolly would play. And there was rumors of many, many affairs, like a revolving door of men servicing Dolly. Despite all of this, the couple remained married and Fred remained blissfully unaware of Dolly's dalliances. And they actually were so successful that Fred decided to open up a second factory in Los Angeles and they relocated in 1918. So Fred and Dolly are living it up in Southern California. And on August 22nd, 1922, Fred and Dolly went out on a date. When they came back, they got into a bit of an argument. Neighbors then heard three gunshots coming from Fred and Dolly's home. Worried, of course, the neighbors called police to go check on Fred and Dolly. And while neighbors sat and waited for the cops and watched the house, they saw that all the lights inside of Fred and Dolly's house turned off about 20 minutes after the gunshots. Apparently response time with the LAPD in 1922 is not super fast. <laughs> when police arrived at Fred and Dolly's home, police went in and they heard a woman yelling, Fred, oh Fred! And they walked into the living room and they see Fred Fred lying there dead on the floor with three gunshot wounds, two to the chest, one to the head. And the voice of the yelling woman was not coming from anywhere nearby, but they eventually found it coming from an upstairs closet. Next to the closet, there's just a little table sitting right next to the door, and there was a key just sitting right on top of the table. And they were like, I guess this is the key to the 
closet? Sure enough, the key opened up the closet, and as soon as it opened, out poured Dolly, immaculately dressed, perfect hair and makeup, demanding to know if her husband was all right. So Dolly launched into her explanation of what the hell had just happened. She told police that her and Fred had just come home from their date, and they were only home for a few minutes when a burglar busted in. Dolly said that they had two prior incidences of attempted break-ins, but this time, apparently somebody got in and they were home when it happened. Fred had been downstairs in the living room, and Dolly was upstairs because she was gonna put her coat away in the coat closet. And before she knew it, she got shoved into the coat closet and the door was locked behind her. She was struggling to get out and she heard three gunshots. And she had been stuck in that closet struggling to get out the entire time until police showed up. Police investigated the scene and the downstairs was a mess. Fred was lying on the living room floor and he had two gunshot wounds to the chest and one to the head from a 25 caliber pistol. There was a bullet lodged in the ceiling and four shell casings on the floor. Now it looked like a burglar had torn the place apart, but the only big thing that was missing was Fred's watch. And this wasn't just any ordinary watch. This was Fred's very special pocket watch that Dolly described in detail. It was a one of a kind custom octagonal, oct octagonal? Oct octagon. Let's try that again. Dolly described the watch as an octagonal, one of a kind, diamond encrusted pocket watch that Fred wore on a chain and kept in his pocket, like his vest pocket, you know? There was a little bit of cash missing from the bedroom, but nothing else was taken. When Detective Klein, the main investigator on the case, reached into Fred's pocket where he kept his pocket watch, he found Fred's wallet in there. And it was stuffed with cash. And he was like, okay, you're gonna take the very identifiable watch and not a stack of cash. And why did a random house invasion turn to murder? Mm. It was not adding up for this guy. And he immediately was suspicious of Dolly. But she was locked in the closet. So he's like, how could she have shot Fred if she was locked in the closet? He even went so far as to examine thoroughly the closet that Dolly was locked in to see if there was like some sort of trap door situation that she could have slinked out of. But he didn't find anything. He found nothing. He had nothing. No leads. He was totally stuck. Now the case of Fred Ostrike's murder would be solved, but it would take about a decade before anybody got any answers. And to really figure out what happened that night, we have to go back to Milwaukee, back to the beginning. Now do you remember how I said Dolly was hoeing it up back in Wisconsin with a bunch of boyfriends? Well, the revolving door of men servicing Dolly closed on one particular day when a sewing machine in the textile factory in Milwaukee broke. So Dolly, being a great business partner and a great wife, she called Singer Sewing Machine to have them send a repairman to fix the sewing machine. And the repairman that showed up, ooh, was a 17-year-old boy named Otto Sandhuber. Otto Sandhuber. And oh shit. Dolly saw him walk in and she was like, Damn. And when she got home that day, she could not stop thinking about Otto Sandhuber. Oh! So Dolly, who was the kind of woman who always had a plan, she concocted a plan to see Otto Sandhuber again. So she called her husband, Fred. She's like, listen, honey, I need you to call up Singer Sewing Machine for me and have them send that same repairman because he was so impressive when he came to the factory the other day. I need him to come to our house because my sewing machine just crapped out on me. And girl, that little unsuspecting 17 year old boy did not know what he was getting into when he showed up at 33 year old Dolly's house and she answered the door in nothing but a silk robe, her finest stockings and some super hot house slippers. Dolly! Now Otto, being a professional, got right to work servicing her sewing machine, but Dolly wanted him to service more than her sewing machine. Here's my sewing machine. Do me on it. <laughs> she hovered over him while he worked, watching him, chatting with him. <laughs> he was pretty embarrassed by the whole situation. Like he's a 17 year old kid. And Otto noticed every time he looked up at Dolly while he was working, she was like moving her robe a little bit more and showing more skin. And he was like, oh my God, she is butt ass naked under that robe. <laughs> Dolly! She was making it pretty obvious that he was summoned here under false pretenses. And wouldn't you know it, one thing led to another, and they totally boned. And that day began a very intense, years-long affair. Ooh, Otto Sanjuba. 
Dolly and Otto found every excuse to be together as much as possible. They were hitting hotels, shacking up together while Fred was working. Dolly was calling in sick, like, oh, I can't come in. <laughs> and then would bring Otto over to her house while Fred was at work. She would even have him come over sometimes while Fred was out drinking, like, as much as possible. And that went on for three years. And they were seeing each other so often that neighbors started to notice. I mean, how could you not? And neighbors would confront Dolly about it and be like, who's this boy we see coming over to your house all the time? And she would say, he was her vagabond half brother. But one neighbor actually told Fred about it and was like, hey, just so you know, there's some boy coming over to your house all the time when you're not home. <gasps> what a narc. <laughs> and Fred actually confronted Dolly about it. He's like, hey, um, a neighbor told me that there's some guy coming over to the house all the time. What gives? And Dolly, who always had an explanation for everything, was quick on her feet. And she was like, oh my God, I know. There's this book and magazine salesman. He has been harassing me. He comes over all the time trying to get me to buy his books and his magazines. And I'm just really nice. Like he's not getting the hint that I'm not interested, it's awful. And Fred bought it and he was like, oh yeah, I totally get it, that sucks. Yeah, salesman, right, ugh. <laughs> you gotta admit, she's quick. But it was at this moment that Dolly realized she was pretty much caught. I mean, she can't keep up the way she's going, so. She tried to stop seeing Otto, but she couldn't. She was addicted to that sweet, sweet loving from her side piece. And she did love Fred in her own way, mostly she loved his money, but she loved Otto too. She loved them both and she didn't want to choose. She wanted everything to stay exactly the same. So she came up with a plan. It's a fucking bonkers plan. She tells Otto, you quit your job and then move into the attic here in the house that I share with my husband. Now you won't be able to go outside because then neighbors will see you, but you can live here for free I'll feed you, I'll clothe you, and then we can spend every moment together when Fred's not here. When Fred is here, you stay up in the attic. It's the perfect plan. And poor Otto, he thought it was a great plan too. This poor kid was an immigrant, an orphan. He had no family, no friends. The only person that he cared about and spent his time with was Dolly. And he wanted to do whatever it took to be with her and keep her happy, which is pretty sad. He also had big dreams of being a writer. So he kind of took this as an opportunity to be like, hey, I can spend all of the time that Fred is home working on my writing. I don't have to work anymore. So they followed through with the plan. Dolly cleaned up the attic real nice. She put an oil lamp up there for him, a little desk, some paper, some writing implements, a really comfy bed. And she's like, here you go, honey. She put a padlock on the attic access door. And she explained it to Fred by saying, I don't want someone accidentally going up there and disturbing my furs because she had an extensive fur coat collection. And typical husband, Fred was like, furs? Yeah, okay, whatever. By day, Fred would go to work and Otto would come down from the attic. He would help Dolly with the housework. And actually years later when Otto was interviewed, he spoke with great pride with how he took care of that house. Like he took his job very seriously. He kept that place sparkling. He's like, Dolly loves a super clean floor. I scrubbed that floor, I kept it very shiny. He helped with all of the cooking, all of the food prep. He took great pride in how he took care of Dolly's vegetables because Dolly liked very pristine vegetables. He took care of even Fred's things. He took care of all of Fred's fine clothes and he would always dust and polish shoes because he wanted to keep Fred looking sharp. I can't make this shit up. And he also said that he was servicing Dolly eight to 10 times a day, every day. And to that, I say, I do not believe you. <laughs> like, come on. But if it's true, Dolly. Dolly, where do you get your energy and how can I get some? Like, holy shit. Dolly had herself her own attic sex slave, literally. 
at night when Fred would come home, Otto would go back up to the attic and he would read and he would write working on his Pulp Fiction stories. And I learned something today. I didn't know what Pulp Fiction stories were. I only know Pulp Fiction as the movie. It never occurred to me what that meant. So in case you don't know, Pulp Fiction stories were fictional stories that were written in the early 1900s that were typically very racy and action packed that were printed in cheap newspapers and magazines. And they were often printed on super cheap paper that was made from wood pulp. Pulp fiction. I don't know how I never knew that. So at night, Otto would be handwriting all of his fiction stories because he couldn't have a typewriter up there because Fred would hear him clickety-clacking away. And then he would give them to Dolly who would type them for him. And she even had a P.O. box set up for just this. And she would send his writings that she typed up for him off to publishers. Now after a while, Otto actually started getting some of his stories published and was making a little bit of money. But I read that Dolly kept all of it, which is shitty. But I also read that Dolly and Otto at one point in their relationship had a shared bank account. So I don't know what their deal was with financial stuff but I don't know. The whole relationship is completely fucking weird, so this does not matter. Otto was also working on making bathtub gin, and he could sneak down in the middle of the night for a midnight snack as long as he didn't wake up Fred. Now, poor Fred. He would sometimes mention to Dolly weird things he was hearing and noticing around the house. Fred said that he heard strange noises in the home sometimes. Or he'd say, hey, I thought we had more leftovers, where's all the food going? And Dolly would gaslight the shit out of Fred and blame his drinking. She would be like, oh, you don't remember? You were wasted last night and you ate an entire leg of lamb. And he would believe her. He would be like, oh yeah, I was pretty drunk last night, wasn't I? Huh. <laughs> and Otto successfully hid in the attic of the Milwaukee house for two years. So the total length of the affair so far is five years. Three years sneaking around and two years as attic boy. Now in 1918 is when Fred decided to open up the second factory in Los Angeles and when he approached Dolly and said, hey, I want to move to LA, Dolly said she would only go if she could pick out their new house and Fred had no say in it. And he was like, typical husband, like, I super don't care what house you pick, like, go nuts. <laughs> So he let Dolly pick the house and Dolly scoured Los Angeles for the perfect home with a large attic, which was actually apparently really difficult to find in Los Angeles at the time. And then she sent Otto to Los Angeles ahead of her and Fred and was like, go get yourself settled in the attic before us and the movers get there. And he did it. Otto went, <laughs> Otto went and moved from one attic to another across the country so he could maintain his attic boy relationship with Dolly. Holy shit. In Los Angeles, the arrangement was the same. And Fred was actually thriving in Los Angeles. He was loving it. He was working hard. The factory was going super well. He was getting super rich. And Dolly was living it up at home with her attic sex slave, getting busy up to eight times a day. Everyone's living their best life. <laughs> Now in the LA house, Fred still complained of the same noises and weirdness that he was experiencing in Milwaukee. And Dolly just kept gaslighting him. Once Fred and Dolly were in the backyard and he looked up and he saw the shadowy figure of a man in the attic window. Despite the fact that Otto had strict rules to stay away from the window. Bad, bad attic boy. So Fred jumps up and he runs like he's gonna go investigate the intruder in the house. And Dolly stops him. She's like, A, you're crazy. I didn't see shit. And B, I can't have you running up into my attic causing a ruckus. You could disturb my furs. I will investigate. <laughs> and he let her. And Dolly went up to the attic to investigate and then came back and she told Fred, there's nothing up there. I'm worried about you. You need to see a doctor about these hallucinations. You need to take care of yourself. And Fred did. He made an appointment and saw a doctor. He's like, I guess I'm hallucinating. <laughs> oh my God. Fred, you dumb dumb. So this brings us up to 1922, year of Fred's murder. Otto had been attic boy for four years in LA. So the total length of the affair is nine years at this point, <laughs> six of which were attic dwelling, okay? So what really happened on the night of Fred's murder, you ask? Well, Dolly and Fred had been out on a date, and when they came home, they did get into an argument. Otto, from up in the attic, heard the argument. And he was listening closely, and Otto had heard many arguments coming from downstairs, but this time, he heard a big, 
thud. He immediately got very frightened for Dolly. Dolly had alluded to the fact that when Fred was drunk, he could be abusive. So Otto went into defensive mode. He panicked, he slunk down from the attic through the access panel in Fred and Dolly's closet, went over to the bedroom bureau and got Dolly's 25 caliber pistols. And he came running out into the living room holding two guns. And Otto saw Dolly laying on the floor and Fred standing over her. Now Fred hears a noise and turns and sees a man standing in his house holding two guns. And all of a sudden, light bulb moment. The kid that repaired the sewing machines in my factory like 10 years ago is in my house? Suddenly everything from the past decade makes complete sense. I knew I wasn't crazy. I knew somebody was eating my lamb. I knew I heard noises. I knew somebody was in my house and I knew somebody was fucking my wife. I can't even imagine what went through Fred's head in those couple of seconds before he launched into action. Can you imagine? I mean, no, no. Now Fred lunged at Otto and a kerfuffle ensued. Now poor Otto, he was a small, thin, pale boy with glasses with a severe vitamin D deficiency. He could not hold his own against Fred. So Fred overpowered Otto very quickly and they were struggling over one of the 25 calibers and boom, it went off and the bullet lodged in the ceiling. Now this was just enough to distract Fred so that Otto could get a hold of the other gun and pow, he shot Fred three times, twice in the chest, once in the head. After the shock subsided, obviously Dolly was very upset. She did love Fred in her own way, and she loved Otto too. She had enough love for both, but even though Otto killed Fred, she didn't want to lose Otto. So the woman who always had an answer, the woman who always had a plan, stage a burglary. So Dolly and Otto trashed the living room. Dolly gave Otto the diamond pocket watch. She got a little bit of cash from the bedroom and gave it to him and then gave him both of the guns. Then Otto locked Dolly in the coat closet and he left the key for the closet door right next to the door to make sure that the cops could get her out easily. He didn't want her stuck in the closet for too long and getting uncomfortable. And then Otto took the pocket watch, the cash and the guns and went up to the attic and hid and hoped that the police didn't investigate the attic when they came, which luckily for Otto, they didn't. Now I mentioned earlier that Detective Klein, who was investigating Fred's murder, was suspicious of Dolly from the start, but he couldn't explain how she could have shot Fred while she was locked in the closet. And he had zero leads on who could have helped her. Nobody knew Attic Boy existed, but Detective Klein kept his eye on Dolly and he did not let it go. Now after Fred's death, Dolly hired an estate lawyer named Herman Shapiro to help settle her husband's affairs and to help her get that cheddar. Mm -hmm. Now Dolly inherited many millions from Fred's estate and she used that to buy a new house with, you guessed it, a really nice attic. She told people that asked why she moved that it was too painful to keep living in the house where Fred was murdered, which was probably true and makes total sense. And Otto moved with her and moved into the attic. Now you may be wondering why? Like. Fred's dead, there's no one to hide from anymore. Can't he like come downstairs? But Otto would later say he'd been in the attic for so long and it was all he knew. And after all these years, him and Dolly's relationship was based on a dominant submissive dynamic. And he liked his attic. He felt comfortable and safe up there. and He didn't want to come down. <laughs> so sad. But he was able to get a typewriter up there because he didn't have to be quiet anymore. Which is something, I guess. But one man, as we've learned, is not enough for Dolly. And she began a relationship with her lawyer, Herman Shapiro, who had no idea that when he went over to visit his girlfriend and engage in a little sexual relations, there was a dude up in the attic listening to everything. <laughs> But in 1923, so the spring after Fred was killed, Detective Klein actually bumped into Herman Shapiro at the courthouse one day. And he knew that Dolly had hired Herman as her estate lawyer because like I said, Klein was like totally stalking Dolly and following every move she made. And as they're chatting, I kid you not, Shapiro was like, well, I should be going, I have a meeting. And he pulls out his pocket watch and Klein was like, where'd you get that? pocket watch. And this was no ordinary pocket watch. It was a one of a kind octagonal diamond encrusted pocket watch. <laughs> and Shapiro was like, oh, my girlfriend, I mean, my, my client got it for me for my birthday. Isn't it lovely? <laughs> and Klein had to break it to the guy. I hate to tell you this, buddy. <gasps> that watch was taken off a dead guy and I need you to give it to me because it is evidence. 
So that was enough for Klein to call Dolly in for questioning. And he was like, how is it that your dead husband's pocket watch, which was supposed to be taken by burglars, is now in the hands of your new boyfriend? But Dolly, who always has an answer for everything, oh my god, it's so funny. I found it in the yard. <laughs> just sounded like a Kardashian. <laughs> She's like, I didn't think it was important. I didn't want to bother anybody. But it was too painful for me to hold on to it. And I also didn't want it to just sit around collecting dust. It's too beautiful. So I gave it to Herman and he loves it. Now this was not enough to arrest Dolly because she's not the one that pulled the trigger. She was locked in the closet. But Detective Klein thought, okay, well maybe her lawyer was her accomplice. But as he dug into Dolly's personal life and asked around, he found out that Dolly and Herman actually didn't know each other before Fred died. So she really did meet him when she hired him to settle her husband's affairs. But in digging around in Dolly's personal life and asking a lot of questions, they stumbled across a man named Roy Klum, Dolly's other, other boyfriend, Dolly. So she's got attic boy, lawyer boy, and now this other boy, Roy Klum. Again, where does she get her energy? Now Klum hears that cops are asking questions and he finds out that she's been dating her lawyer too? Oh, he is pissed. He immediately breaks up with Dolly and he immediately goes to police to get revenge on her cheating ass. Mm-hmm. And Roy Klum tells police, yeah, Dolly, Right after Fred died, she gave me the broken pieces of a 25 caliber pistol wrapped in a handkerchief and she told me to throw it somewhere where nobody would find it. And I did. I took it to the La Brea tar pits and I chucked it in. But luckily for police, Clum didn't have a very good arm. And when he went to the tar pits, he didn't like throw it very far and it just like kind of landed on the edge. So cops just went to the tar pits and they found it like just kind of sticking in. <laughs> they just went and picked it up. <laughs> So police went and picked up Dolly again for questioning. And Detective Klein is like, okay, so why did you tell your other boyfriend to get rid of a gun that was in your possession right after your husband died? Was it the murder weapon? And Dolly was like, oh my God, funny story. <laughs> I found it while I was cleaning. And I was like, oh my God, how crazy would it be if I had a gun in my house right after my husband died? Like, what if somebody thought that I did it? And I just didn't feel safe. So I gave it to Roy and I was like, get rid of that. And he did it for me. Always had an answer for everything. She's quick on her feet, man. But having found two pieces of critical evidence linked back to Dolly, Detective Klein felt comfortable enough to arrest Dolly. And she was arrested on July 12th, 1923. The news hit the papers. And because of this, Dolly's next door neighbor suddenly felt very comfortable coming to the police with a little more information, as they do. So Dolly's next door neighbor tells police that Dolly had come to him and said, I have this gun. And it's super similar to the kind of gun that killed Fred. And I'm frightened. I don't want someone to think I did it. Can you get rid of it for me? And the neighbor was like, sure, honey. And he took the gun and he buried it in his rose bushes. So they have the pocket watch and two guns, right? And Dolly was arrested and she was held on a $50,000 bond. And trial was scheduled for December of 1923 but the only person they had to testify was Roy Klum. And they had the guns, but they knew Dolly wasn't the one that pulled the triggers. So they dropped the charges and they let her go. And she went about her life for seven years. But in 1930, so seven years after Dolly was released, Dolly and Herman Shapiro, they broke up. And it was an ugly breakup. And much like Roy Klum did seven years prior, Herman Shapiro went straight to the cops to get revenge on Dolly, and he told a whopper of a story. Shapiro told police that when Dolly was arrested in 23, he had gone to visit her when she was in jail, and she asked Shapiro for a favor. She's like, here's what I need you to do. I need you to go to the grocery store, and I need you to bring a bag of groceries to my house. And Shapiro was like, your house is empty. And she's like, no, it's not. And he's like, do you have a cat? And she's like, no, I do not. I need you to go and get a bag of groceries and bring it to my house. I need you to go inside, put the bag of groceries in front of the attic door. Then I need you to scratch three times on the door so he knows it's safe to come out and then leave. Shapiro's like, who is in your attic? And Dolly's like, it's my vagabond half-brother and he does not like visitors. Oh, holy shit. 
and Shapiro must have really loved her because he took her little grocery list and he went shopping and he went to her house and he brought the groceries and he scratched three times on the door and as he turned to leave, he was like, nah, I gotta see this guy. I gotta meet this half brother or whatever the fuck is going on. <laughs> so Shapiro waits and sure enough, a small, thin, pale man with glasses came out of the attic door. And at first he was shocked to see a man in the house. But after a few seconds, he reached out his hand and he said, hi, I'm Otto Sanhuber. You must be Herman Shapiro. Don't be frightened of me. <laughs> Shapiro was like, mm, okay, you must be the half brother I've heard so much about. And Otto was like, brother, I am Dolly's lover. And Shapiro was like, that's funny, I am too. What the fuck? <laughs> Poor Otto. So isolated, so lonely, so socially awkward. He was pretty excited to have a human being to talk to that wasn't Dolly, you know? So he sat down and he told Shapiro his entire life story. He told him everything from how he was an orphan, an immigrant, how he used to work for Fred. Do you know Fred? Yeah, I used to work for Fred. And then I fell in love with Dolly and we've been doing it like rabbits eight times a day, every day since then. And I moved into the attic and I've, I mean, the whole story. And he also told Shapiro that he killed Fred, but he did it in self-defense because he was abusive and he was gonna hurt Dolly. He could have killed her if he hadn't done it. I mean, holy shit, Shapiro's head had to have been exploding. That's a lot of information to take in in just a couple of minutes from an attic boy that you did not know existed. And Shapiro asked him, he's like, have you been here? Like, were you up there when I came over? And I was like, yeah. I was up there, but don't worry. We have really good insulation. I didn't hear much. I can't make this shit up. <laughs> so this was all just a lot for Shapiro to take in. So he tells Otto, just give me, stay here. Give me some time to figure out what to do. Actually goes to Dolly's criminal defense attorney and Dolly. And he's like, there's a man in the attic who says he killed Fred. Ugh. What the fuck are we gonna do? And everyone agrees, including Dolly, that this cannot come out and Otto cannot be found. Now Shapiro, like I said, he really must have loved Dolly because he tells her, I still wanna be with you. But the only way I'm staying with you is if attic boy goes. And Dolly agreed on one condition. Shapiro had to get Otto a job and a place to live so that he'd be safe. And Shapiro said, cool, I'm on it. And he found a place to live and a job as a janitor for Otto in San Francisco. He's like, I'm getting you as far away from my girlfriend as possible. <laughs> and off Otto went. And then the charges on Dolly were dropped and Dolly and Shapiro had been dating all this time since then. But now that they had a messy breakup, he was done keeping her secrets and he was done covering her ass. So police track down Otto and they bring him back to LA for questioning and he told police everything he told Shapiro. He told them everything. He also said the murder of Fred was self-defense. So police arrested Otto and Dolly. Now, when the press got a hold of this story, they went wild, murdered millionaire husband, sex slave in the attic. And the press came up with a bunch of silly nicknames for Otto, like the Batman of Los Angeles, the attic lover, the bat boy, silliness. Now in the end, after the trials, Otto Sanhuber was found guilty of manslaughter not murder. I guess the jury took into consideration that Otto was groomed and <laughs> taken advantage of as a teenager by Dolly. And they also bought into the self-defense storyline and the guns that they found were super corroded and rusty. So they couldn't actually confirm that those were the murder weapons. So Otto was charged with manslaughter and the next day at sentencing, he was sentenced to zero days in prison because the statute of limitations had run out on manslaughter. And so he was free to go. And about a month later, when Dolly's trial was over, the jury came back and said that they were hopelessly deadlocked and they could not come to an agreement on if she was guilty or not. So a mistrial was declared and Dolly was sent back to jail so that the DA could decide if it was even worth it to retry. And ultimately he decided it was not worth the time and the money to go through an entire retrial, especially 
if it was gonna end up just like Otto and she was gonna get reduced to manslaughter and be free to go anyway. So all the charges were dropped and Dolly was free to go. Otto and Dolly never spoke again and both were free to live out the rest of their lives. Otto worked his way to Canada where he changed his name to Walter Klein and he ended up getting married and starting a family and they ended up actually settling back in Los Angeles but he never approached Dolly again and he lived out the rest of his life in obscurity. Dolly ended up remarrying as well, which was never difficult for her to find a man, as we know. And it seems Dolly learned her lesson and kept it to one man for the rest of her life. I mean, as far as we know. But she was able to keep her many millions and she lived in Los Angeles with her husband and lived to be 80 years old and died in 1961. Holy shit. I can't believe I had never heard this story. It was so bonkers. Have you ever heard a story so crazy? It sounds fake from start to finish. And I loved every second of it. Rest in peace to poor Fred Osterreich. He really got the short end of the stick. No justice for that guy. And honestly, poor Otto. I know he killed a dude and that's awful. But come on, he was straight up groomed and taken advantage of and held as a sex slave in several attics for like a freaking decade. I still think him and Dolly should have had to pay for what they did but I'm just acknowledging that Otto was also a victim in this story, this completely batshit crazy story. And that is the end of today's twisted tale about Dolly Osterreich. <gasps> Wild. If you like this story, give me a like and leave me a comment and let me know what you thought. And also let me know if there's a case that you're interested in that you want me to cover. And be sure to subscribe because I will be back next week with a new episode of Cleaning and Crime. Thank you so much for watching, you guys, and I'll see you next time.